Let's not go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to That Gets My Goat on the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. My name is Big Anklevich. Actually, that's not really my name. It's kind of a pseudonym, but we've been over that already. My name is Rich Outfield. I've legally changed it. I don't know why I did that. I was drinking heavily before <laughs> I made that decision. But I was also drinking heavily when I said, let's go see Amazing Spider-Man 2. I heard that it's not good, but I want to see it. <laughs> okay, wait. What actually, how did that conversation really go? I think you said that we couldn't pay you to see it, but... When you found out that Doonstief subscription money was paying for it, you were like, oh, sure, I'll go. That's terrible. I would never say such a thing like that. <laughs> I, and, you know, I, okay, I, it's not like he dragged me screaming to see this movie. I, I happen to really, really like Spider-Man. He's my favorite superhero. Uh, two hours after seeing that movie, he's still my favorite superhero. So Zack Snyder didn't have anything to do with this film, apparently. But uh, I was afraid that it wasn't going to be good. I, I, there was one review in particular that said that, you know, after this movie, not only do I never want to see another Spider-Man movie, I never want to see another movie again. And I was just like, oh, no, never again. What do you think led to that? What were the, I mean, we're going to, starting off here, we're going to talk about Amazing Spider-Man 2, and we're going to spoil uh movie that was already spoiled I, it spoiled rotten this thing is nasty but if you don't want spoilers or whatever then yeah don't listen because we're going to talk about specific things in the movie yeah, so we're not here to uh to recommend a movie to people or to recommend that they skip it where well, this isn't sneak previews we just talk about our feelings and just talk about the movie we're not actual reviewers so, I mean, I would hope people understand that, it, you know, there's never going to be a spoiler-free review yeah. on this show. These are all post-show chats. It's like the post-story chat that we have on our regular mm. Dune Steve show, except for you go watch the movie and then you listen to the post-story yeah, here that on That Gets My Goat. So, what do you think the things co that caused Movie Bob to never want to see another movie uh, were from this film? Well, I mean, I, I I did check out that review, and he he said that this was it wasn't a movie so much as it was a series of advertisements for other Spider-Man related projects that Sony was going to make, and you know I guess I kind of see that, but not really. Yeah, I didn't pick up on that so much. Um, but he was he just talked about how soulless it was and how it just you know not well done, and half-assed it felt like you know. Like, this is our contractual obligation album. Uh, you you Christmas, can write a song. It was the Christmas album. I, I can write a song. And if neither of us write a song, we'll just make one up while we're recording or whatever because we, we owe the record label this <laughs> album. And in some ways, that's what Fox and Sony are doing with their Marvel properties. And, you know, it's easy to vilify those guys because now we have Marvel Studios that seems to do everything right. Uh, and then they're actually Marvel themselves. But, you know, Marvel fell upon really, really hard times in the 90s. And they had to sell off these properties to continue to exist as a comic book company. They filed for bankruptcy and were bought by their own toy company. The, you know, the, the manufacturer of their action figures bought the company. So, you know, they farmed out a bunch of these properties and the money started to come in. Because of them, enough that they could start their own little studio, and uh, it's the little studio that could, although it's now owned by Disney, so it doesn't feel like a little studio anymore. But there's still these three major properties that are owned by the other studios because they're exploited. You know what I mean? Legally exploited. And so, and it's Spider Man, X Men, and Fantastic Four, as long as the studios continue to exploit those properties, they own those, the rights to those. And so we will continue to see Spider-Man movies forever. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what would happen to stop Sony from making Spider-Man movies unless something bad happened to Sony and they needed money. And they said to Buena Vista, you can have Spider-Man for half a billion dollars or, you know, $750 million or something like that. That's the only situation where I can see 
Spider-Man going back to Marvel Studios. But because Sony is not a movie studio, it's a giant conglomerate. I don't, I don't think that'll ever happen. But I'm sure that Sony Pictures is kind of a separate thing, if you know what I'm saying. You know, it's a division of... And I, I bet that they are a separate company, kind of in name or whatever, and then they have to keep their own books, kind of a thing. So you never know. I mean, I don't know exactly how that crap works, but... Um, well, for just a second, let's do a little history lesson. Uh, Spider-Man 3 came out, I believe, in 2007, and it cost a lot of money, and it opened really, really big, but it didn't make as much as Spider-Man 2 or Spider-Man 1. And Sony, at some point, made the decision to let Sam Raimi go, Tobey Maguire go, Kirsten Dunst go, and reboot, to start the Spider-Man franchise over with the intention of doing it more cheaply. And so Mark Webb was hired, and they gave him an extra year than Sam Raimi had to do Spider-Man 4, and they made Amazing Spider-Man cheaply. They made it responsibly, is the word I use, but no one else ever does. And it did all right. It didn't do as well as Spider-Man 3. But because it was cheaper, that's probably okay. But then this movie was made. And this thing cost like what Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2 put together cost. So I, so I kind of wonder, well, why, why did you reboot it, guys? I don't know. Maybe they were hoping to jumpstart it back into the right direction since it was steadily going downhill. Or maybe they just can't help themselves, you know? When people make movies these days, they have to be the most expensive things possible. You know, once they saw, hey, we made money on the last one, we need to use all that money and then some on the new... I don't know. The sad thing is, it was kind of... there. I mean, there was good things about it, I have to admit. Yeah, I'm sorry if I said that it was an absolute turd at the very beginning. I didn't mean to say that. It was not a good movie. But it was not the worst movie I've seen yeah. this year. Yeah, there's good, and you know, my my son went and saw this movie already too. He saw it, I think, a couple of days before me. Then I was asking him how he liked it because I'd already heard Rich tell me about Movie Bob's review and how he wanted to never ever see another movie again because of it. So I was curious what my son thought of it after a, you know, a, a recommendation like that, and he said that he liked it better than the first one. <laughs> it's funny because right before we went into the film, I realized that I don't remember a friggin' thing about the first one. I did see it, but, like, yeah, Rish was reminding me that the lizard was the uh, the villain in the last film. I didn't even remember that. I He made such an impression that I'd forgotten entirely who the villain was. I didn't remember it at all. So, yeah, I, I have no idea if I liked it better than the first one. I cannot remember. But the one thing that my son did say is that he liked the character of Spider-Man. And he liked that the Spider-Man was more like what he thinks Spider-Man should be instead of all mopey. And I don't know exactly how to describe the way that Tobey Maguire did it. But, you know, Spider-Man is always kind of the wisecracking you know, never shuts up. And that's one of the things that all the villains, you know, they hated about him so much that he would never shut up. As they would fight him, he would keep making fun of him, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the whole way through. And at least Spider-Man is that way, which I kind of like. I don't know if you agree with that. You're well, much I, more of a Spider-Man connoisseur. I am. I Oh, I love Spider-Man. But, uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, the, one of the funniest comics I ever read was an issue of Excalibur where a bunch of villains are in a bar together and they're all talking about their exploits. And he's like, yeah, and I fought Captain America. And that guy's like, yeah, I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with, you know, Captain Marvel once. Or, although, I don't suppose Captain Marvel actually exists, so. <laughs> I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Howard the Duck once. You know, I don't get no respect. And, like, the juggernaut says something like, he's like, I once pounded Spider-Man within an inch of his life. And all the other guys are like, here, here. He's like, I would have liked to see that. And, he goes, and one of them goes, God, I hate Spider-Man. And they all go, yeah, agreed. <laughs> they all hate Spider-Man more. It's the one thing that like unifies all these thugs in a bar in this comic. That wasn't even about Spider-Man. And I was just like, wow, that's so cool. Um, and, and yes, he, he has a big mouth and he makes fun of uh, 
of everything, and he never shuts up. He's always quipping. And yet, you know, I think it's a defense mechanism. This film felt really mopey to me. I don't know. I, I, I felt like it was extraordinarily mopey, more so than any of the Maguire flicks. But when he had the mask on, he put on a, a happy face and, and clowned around. And, and I think that is Spider-Man. I, this is a guy who doesn't go out and fight crime because it earns him a living or because it's fun or because of revenge. He does it because of guilt, because he failed to act and he can never get past the fact that somebody close to him died because he didn't go out there. And for my entire life, there have been two shadows over Spider-Man. One is the Uncle Ben death, and then the other is Gwen Stacy's death. And Ben died because Peter had this power, and he didn't use it. And Gwen died because he was Spider-Man. And so it was a lose-lose situation for this poor guy. I, I don't know. I mean, everybody has their own interpretation of who the character is, but I, I, that is a big part of the character for me, is he puts on the mask, and he gets to go out and be funny and work out his frustrations and, and make a difference or whatever. Once the mask comes off, he's just a miserable poor guy who tries to do his best but can never end up on top. And I, I've talked to other people that is like, that's why I hate Spider-Man. And I'm like, okay, I, you know, I guess that's valid. If, if, if that doesn't speak to you, then I can understand Spider-Man not being your bag. But that totally, totally speaks to me. Anyhow, this movie... Uh, I didn't like it as much as the first one, and I didn't love the first one. Part of it felt like it was just so loud and filled with flashy stuff, and, and you could see the budget on the screen. I mean, it just uh, the, here is an example of the spending money for no reason at all. There was a CG Oscorp spokeswoman, <laughs> and we saw her two or three times, and it's just like... You know, even if this only cost half a million dollars, why? Why would you guys do this? Why Why not just have there be somebody or a disembodied voice? Why would you have a CG lifelike character as the Oscorp computer? I always love how they do that kind of stuff. Like when Gwen Stacy was trying to search for Max, whatever his last name was. Dylan. Dylan. And... She gets in and she's like searching and they always do stuff like that. Like she's searching for him and then the computer just brings up pictures and flashes through a bunch of them really fast. Like the computer can't just go to Max. She said Max Dylan. Mm -hmm. And yet the computer's flashing through all the pictures. Boo, 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 boo. It's like the, the scene from War Games as it's like trying to, oh, it's got five numbers in the code, you know, and they're all flash. Oh, it's got six. If anybody has ever used a computer... You write, like, search Dylan, and then that's all that comes up. Why would it flash through all the pictures? Or worse, the guy, when she's doing that, then the people in the security office see that she's searching. And he types in, cancel search, lockdown user. He ty you see it type in onto the screen. What the hell? That isn't how computers work. Nobody uses a computer like that. They, like, go into the menu and they click on buttons and stuff and say, <laughs> cancel search, lockdown. You know, it's just, uh, I hate how they always do weird crap with computers to make it, like, more visual. Even, like, the... the They're trying to make it more visually dynamic. And yeah. Like when Harry is searching through all of his father's old files or whatever. Yeah. It's this crystal on the table, magic open and flip open thing. Yeah. The, it's the Minority Report thing. I don't remember ever seeing it before Minority Report. But you see it all the time now. And yeah, okay, maybe that's the wave of the future. But it's still so much easier to just double click with the mouse. Right. It just cracks me up. And yeah, and, and another thing at the end when he plays her speech... Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like he's playing it on the computer. It's playing. And then when it finishes, there's static. Static appears before it goes away. I guess that's supposed to signal to the audience, hey, it's done. But nobody has seen static on a digital file that they've watched on a computer ever. <laughs> You don't see static at the end of a YouTube video to signal that, hey, this is done. It just goes to black and it stops. And like 15 other things that you can watch that are related to it. 
with like little thumbnails of like a close-up of some girl's cleavage appear yes. and then you watch it and there's actually no cleavage in it <laughs> yeah. whatsoever somehow <laughs> but that you know that's why you, you don't see static that's like what happened at the end of vhs tapes in 1988 but apparently they you know they've got to have futuristic talking 3d face woman on the computer that asks you what floor you want to go to and oh, and Jamie Foxx gallantly tells the computer what floor she wants to go to for her because he's such a gentleman. <laughs> what the hell that was all about? Here, let me get that for you. <laughs> floor 34. Wow, that's so gallant. <laughs> you have this stupid thing there. And then also, oh, while we're at it, let's go back to 1988 with the static at the end of the video because, you know, there's some goofy stuff. But the thing, the one thing. That actually, I was laughing. I, I don't know if you could, I, if you saw I, I me think laughing. I know what you're going to talk about. I was laughing like crazy when they got to the end of this, and this has got to be the, the main thing. When Movie Bob says, "I never want to see another movie again," this is the reason. This thing right here was so blatantly. We got to do this because this is what you do in a movie thing. The power grid gets broken or whatever, and everybody's power goes out. And, oh, at LaGuardia Airport, we find out that we've got two planes on a crash course with each other. And if we don't get power back so we can tell them in four minutes, oh, let's start the timer. Yeah, clock it now, please. <laughs> Why would they do that? <laughs> I don't know. So I guess they can follow the how she says, oh, four and a half minutes away. We know this. Somehow, and yet we got to use a stopwatch to, I don't know, but, but that was the most contrived, stupid thing ever. It's like, we got to have a countdown danger thing. A lot of times they'll do stuff like, oh, you got to have personal danger. So uh, automatically the terrorists will capture John McClane's wife somehow, or, you know, there's always that thing. It's got to be the personal thing. It's got to be the, the time counting down, but this dumb thing about the two planes and you just kept we kept cutting back to these planes flying and Spider-Man had no idea that's true that these planes were on a collision course so he couldn't like oh I got to get it done before 4 minutes and 30 seconds is up which is the whole point of that kind of crap is that the hero knows that there's a time you know it's like the bomb is ticking 3 2 oh he got it he clipped the blue wire just in time and it stopped at 1 second and the bomb didn't go off but this was that same thing but without any purpose and you kept cutting to these people in the plane oh no all these people are going to die if spider-man doesn't stop electron time and then they get the power back just in time and the planes fly right past each other and yay and the whole control room Claps and well, cheers. it's because they radioed the captains and said, "Hey, we need you to turn vector four point six right now. Do it now!" And they do it, and they're a millimeter apart from the other plane. And it's just like, well, so Ray Charles was flying one plane, and Stevie <laughs> hey. Wonder was flying the other plane. <laughs> it was really stormy. They couldn't see in those clouds. Okay. Although I totally saw the big headlight from the other plane coming right at the other one so you know i'm pretty sure that they could have turned on their own but yeah that had to be just the worst thing i've seen in a movie in a really long time that was so <laughs> well it was awful. weird because it, it like you said it was so not connected to the rest of the narrative none of the radio control guy what do they call them air flight control guys air traffic control were characters from the rest of the movie nobody on either plane was a character from the movie, then, you know, after they get the message and the two planes barely miss each other, they they they, they uh, swap paint in the air. Everybody's like, oh, yes, hugging and cheering, and we yeah, did it. Yeah, because that's what you do yeah, when that It's happens. a little Apollo 13 moment, but it was just like some strange yeah, it was... YouTube clip where somebody has spliced in footage from another movie. Right, that's what it, it was totally, that it was the weirdest thing. And it was so dumb. Why did that get in there? It was the worst thing I've seen in a film in a long time. It was like they opened their little screenwriting book and went, Oh, crap. We forgot to put this in. 
Oh, quick, quick. Uh, a, a plane. There could be a plane that's going to crash. Yeah, let's put that in. Wait, oh. wait, but why would the electricity going out cause a plane to crash? Oh, because the air traffic control. Yeah, we need the air traffic controllers because they need to cheer when, when that's important. Right, but it's... if the power went out, why wouldn't these pilots just you know, go to another airport or, 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 or slow down or do something because it's like, oh, shoot, New York is in a blackout. We're not going to know where the uh, the airport is. Maybe we should fly on to Newark. <laughs> well, you got me there, but I'm, I'm sorry. We're just going to ignore that. It was ridiculous. And it seemed like, you know, they, they just had a bunch of people reenact some scenes from other movies are like, okay, at the end of Independence Day, when the thing blows up, everybody cheers and they clap and they hug each other. And also at the end of Apollo 13, when you hear their voice and everybody, che- okay, yeah, let's do, let's do, yeah, we need that. And so they just put it in there. It was unbelievably awful. But it was another thing that they spent a ton of money on. <laughs> yeah. Those planes didn't exist. I complained for a long time. <laughs> I mean, I guess we've known for over a year now what Electro was going to look like. But every time he was on screen, I was just like, wow, this has to cost a lot. Do you know, just to just to make his eyes black and blue has to cost a lot of money. But for the most part, he always looked ridiculous, dude. Yeah. You know was... what I mean? To the point where I, I started to think, well, just keep the hood on. He was more effective when he was had the, the hood and all that stuff. It, it was like every time I saw the CG mask on Hal Jordan and I'd just be like, well, huh. <laughs> He's not really wearing a mask. Yeah. I wonder if he's wearing like a green little piece on the... And I, I would watch that instead of pay attention to the, the narrative of the film. And he was really creepy looking with the blue face too. There was something really weird. I, do you think that that would frighten children? Uh, right, this movie was made for children. Right? At least... At least he had clothes on, though. I mean, it wasn't the straight up exactly like Dr. Manhattan. Although, he how... He reminded you Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, didn't? how he had clothes on, though, doesn't make a lot of sense. Because he, like, turned into electricity. And then came back and is like, hey, my clothes are back, too. It's one of those weird things that you get. You know, it's like how are Hulk's pants still there? Because they fit him when he was Bruce Banner. And he grew to ten times the size but somehow his waist didn't grow. It you know, his the, legs the grew. The relaxed fit. His legs grew, trust. but not his waist. But yeah, it's those weird things that you get sometimes. The paradoxes of, wait a minute, that doesn't work. But you know, whatever. That He was ridiculous, not just when he was Electro, though. Before that, where did Rick Moranis get into this film? He was like the worst stereotypical nerd he like had his pants all uh, you know hiked up so that you know that he had the flood pants on and he had the the bad hair and the goofy glasses and the giant, and the terrible teeth with the huge gap the in the gap middle in his teeth and then when he became electro that got fixed yeah well why i mean if you're made of electricity why are you going to make your teeth not look good oh okay well there you go you can make your teeth however you want i suppose right Oh, well, there was that deleted scene that where they showed that before Max Dillon loved Spider-Man, he loved the Blue Man group. Oh. And, and that was another thing that was terrible. Like, his sudden absolute hatred of Spider-Man because, when he was absolutely in love with Spider-Man before, it was as terribly done as Anakin Skywalker's turn to the dark side. It was just like, no, I can't do it. Oh, yeah, whatever you say, master kind of a thing you know is that okay we're gonna flip the switch and now he's a totally different guy well yeah there's that line where he's like you know then i'm gonna take their power and they'll know what it's like not to have hope and they'll know what it's like not to have (laughs) spider-man it's just like wait 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 you get you jumped from a to q all of a sudden there yeah there there was a step in between and it was it was ridiculous when he was in times square and suddenly he's on all of the screens and i i wondered how did that happen was this part of his power did he put himself on all the screens because they showed a guy filming him but suddenly all of those advertisements in times square were replaced by the electro footage and then the electro footage got replaced by spider-man but it was just dumb i i, I don't yes, wh- how was. does that happen and i don't know then there's this point where he's throwing a fit during the the times square scene and he's shooting lightning and i had to lean over and say I don't understand what is happening. Is he killing those people? I still don't know. I think he probably was supposed to be, yeah, 
He's taken out his frustration on the people, but because this is a kid's movie, we don't ever see that he's actually hurting people. But I just, I, I, I don't know. It's weird because they want to have their cake and eat it too. And they want, you know, a movie that middle-aged guys that live in their parents' basements like me can get all excited about, but they also want little kids to want to buy the action figures and want to have a Spider-Man lunchbox and a Spider-Man athletic supporter and stuff. And so they, they try and have their cake and eat it too. But sometimes you can't. You make a movie like Captain America the Winter Soldier and they made a decision that this was not going to be a movie for little, little kids. And yet my two-year-old absolutely loved it. That's right, because there's Captain America, even yeah. when it was Black Widow. It's crazy. He saw it again the second time we went and watched it, and it's it's insane, the, the love that this kid now has for Captain America. He, ha, We have a Frisbee that he takes around with him everywhere, and it's his shield, and he will actually, when he walks with it, he doesn't hold it in his hand. He puts it on his back, like Captain America, and he walks with it like that everywhere. It is the craziest thing. Okay, well, that's deflecting a little bit of my argument. That I've but, ever seen. But, but sorry, still, uh, uh, going back to your argument about it's, it being for it's, adults. I don't know. It felt like it was for little, little kids. And yet there's the thing that happens at the end of the movie, which you're not going to see on Ultimate Spidey-Man cartoony. <laughs> and I just, uh, to be honest, I'm not even going to blame it on Sony. Although, fuck Sony, guys. <laughs> They are the ones to blame. They are the Lucifer in this particular Paradise Lost, all right? But there were like 15 names when it came time for writing credits on this thing. Now, granted, all of those names were twice, so they get two paychecks. But there were still eight names. And there's our, our villains, guys. You talk about too many villains in a Batman movie or too many villains in a Spider-Man 3. There were too many villains in Amazing Spider-Man 2, and it was all those screenwriters. <laughs> uh, you need somebody who says, hey, I have a, a vision of what this movie should be, and here's the beginning, the middle, and the end, and this is how it should feel, and the, the most important points. It'll only take one minute for me to tell you the idea of this thing. You need somebody who can kind of shepherd a movie through the storytelling process, and it felt like Everybody took a crack at this and everybody had their own agenda and somebody wanted to do, you know, Amazing Spider-Man 121, you know, the night Gwen Stacy died and somebody wanted to do whatever that Blue Man Group, Dr. Manhattan, Jamie Foxx stuff was going on. And somebody wanted to set it up for, a, you know, a whole series of other movies, including a Sinister Six movie. And somebody wanted to, you know, it's like, well, let's focus on uh, the Rhino for some reason in two scenes. Yeah, I just want to quickly weigh in and say that the rhino sucked. <laughs> you didn't like him, huh? That sucked. <laughs> I like the rhino. I think he's kind of cool, but not that rhino. That sucked. That was the worst vision <laughs> of the rhino I have ever seen. I felt like the last seven or eight minutes of the movie, it kind of came alive. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, that's fine. That rhino caught, that was just awful. I mean, I didn't mind that. I, you know, I, if they, I don't know. <laughs> that was just The, you, the robot lame. rhino is what you're talking about. Yes. You, uh, what, what about the stuff at the beginning where he's just a thug? I, I thought that scene I, was all right. Yeah, actually. I didn't mind it. And I didn't mind him being the rhino later at the end and him having to go. It's just, yeah, that just sucked. Like, had they shot him up with rhino sperm or whatever and made him turn into a big tough rhino guy that had that you know the regular old rhino suit and he was just big and rhino-y then that would have been fine but that crappy robot suit <laughs> was so lame do you remember the part where it puts up its dukes like oh you will do fight me now spider there and it's like but a rhino wouldn't do that that's a dude yeah. oh it, well it was ridiculous but you can never get past a certain segment of the population that says, well, seeing a guy in a rhino costume is going to be unbelievable or it's going to be stupid. I think after the way Electro looked in this movie, can you, can anybody use that argument again? I don't know. They, just, at this point, we've got to say, look at what they did with the Green Goblin in this movie. Is a spandex green suit with yellow lightning bolt mask? that ridiculous compared to whatever that misshapen toad creature was that was yeah i was gonna Spider ask you what did you think of green goblin in this movie versus G green goblin in the original spider-man which is worse 
Power Rangers Green Goblin or Toad Green Goblin? <laughs> I mean, they're both awful. Power Rangers Green Goblin is funnier because it's so stupid. <laughs> this one was just... It, it was just inexplicably grotesque and all that stuff, but it... It didn't need to be. I don't I don't understand the changes that they made. Now, yeah, I am a slave to the source material. But there are times when I just have to wonder, well, you guys made this decision because you didn't like the source material or because you just wanted to go against this and say, I don't even care what the original comic was. We're not doing it. Yeah, but you haven't read it. It's like in 1964, Stan Lee said, no, no, we're not reading it. We're not doing it. Whatever that is, we're going to do the opposite. You know what I mean? It's like a little child that makes fists in his yeah. hands. He's like, no, 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 I'm not going to eat it. It's brown. I don't know what to say about that. And there, it smells are... like poop. Wait, what? What are you making <laughs> this kid eat? The the green, the sorry, the, the, the electro origin with not only is he electrocuted, but he falls in to this vat and then he is bitten a bunch of times by electric eels that have been mutated in some amazing That's way. Right. And then he dies, and he's this big black charred husk. And then he breaks free from that big black charred husk. I just was just like, you guys, couldn't we be spending our time on something else? I, I, <laughs> this He was a bad guy who got hit with electricity, and instead of it killing him, it gave him electricity powers. It's not rocket science, you guys. That's it. That's, that's all we need. You know what I mean? It's like Spider-Man got bitten by a radioactive spider, but instead of getting sick, he got the powers of a spider. That's all you need, you guys. It's like, well... Electro got bitten by a radioactive eel. Okay, okay, but then still Instead of dying, he... he got the powers of an eel. All right. He can swim by going, like, doing that wiggly thing like uh, Aquaman used to do. Or was it Aquaman? Who was it that would do that? There was some movie where a guy would swim like that. He would swim like an eel. It was pretty rad. Couldn't have been an Aquaman movie, though. There's no such thing, is there? Not as far as I know. Hmm. Anyways. <clears throat> it's funny, because I don't know how long the movie it was, but let's say it was exactly two hours. We could have... Th th there were a couple of scenes that worked. There was that scene when Peter and Gwen, like, have the little reunion or whatever, and... And, and they're talking and they're sort of playfully bantering. And he's like, no, 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 you can't do that thing with your nose. Whatever. And I was like, you know, this is kind of charming. Um, I, I guess I wanted more scenes like that. In fact, there was a scene where Peter and Harry Osborn are talking. And Peter's like throwing the rocks or whatever. And they're getting to know each other again. And I was like, you know, this is kind of nice. The more scenes like that you have where we care about the people under the suits um, are the more that we care about them once they put on the suit. And, and, you know, I know that that's, that's beyond basic storytelling. That's, that's the step before show don't tell, but <laughs> it still just kind of shocks me that it's like, well, we've got over a hundred million dollars invested in the scene where Spider-Man and Electro fight. And there's all that. You know, and I was just like, yeah, but we got to care what happens. I mean, we have to understand their motivation. And I, I still don't know, what the deal with Electro was. Yeah, I, I had no motive. It didn't make any if sense at anything, all. If anything, you blow up Oscorp and every single one of those bastards that put you there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Why is he mad at Spider-Man makes no sense. Why does he help Harry Osborn makes no sense. Why, you know, he wasn't... It's not... You know, like you were saying, he's a bad guy that gets electrocuted or whatever, and instead of dying, he gets electric powers. He wasn't a bad guy. He was a really good guy. He was a nice guy. He was, you know, socially awkward, but he was a good guy. Why would he become a bad guy just because now he, he can be electric? Boogie, woogie, woogie. I don't know. They were fixing something that didn't need fixing. Sometimes it's easier just to say... This is a bad guy because he's bad. And I know that, you know, that, that we don't believe in that sort of thing in this 50 shades of gray <laughs> kind of world. But it, sometimes it works. Like like the rhino at the beginning of that movie was just a bad guy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that's fine. I wanted to like a couple scenes and I couldn't. Uh, there, there was another scene where Spider-Man came to visit Harry Osborn at his house, I guess, because Osborne realized that Peter knew 
Spider-Man and, and Osborn is dying and he tells Peter, I need Spider-Man's blood. You know Spider-Man. But Peter says, okay, I'll, I'll talk to Spider-Man. I liked that scene a lot where you could see that Peter didn't want to do this because he was his friend, you know, and he goes and, and then Spider-Man comes and I kind of, I liked that scene too. And then Spider-Man says, oh, I can't, I can't help you, you know, cause it might kill you. And he's like, what's it going to do? Kill me more. I'm already dying. And then Spider-Man leaves and Harry shouts, Spider-Man, you're a fraud. And I was just like, oh, this is it. This is the reason he's going <laughs> to hate Spider-Man. Oh, I, I didn't buy it in the same way that there, there's that terrible line that Electro says, where he's like, a world without Spider-Man. I didn't buy it. It wasn't organic. People don't do things like that. They don't go on huge vendettas. You know, it's like, I come to you and I say, you know, I, I've been saving up all that money so that I, you know, I can get this exchange operation. And you say, yeah, I know. And you've been thinking about this a lot. Give the money to me instead. And I go here. That's insanity. It's like people don't make huge decisions, life altering decisions for no reason. I'm going to be a bad guy now for no reason. I, I mean, I understand they tried a little bit with Harry. And it, of course, it would have been helpful if we had seen this character before. Did you feel like we were watching Amazing Spider-Man 2 or did you feel like we were watching Spider-Man 6? Because there were all sorts of things like references to Jameson or whatever, where it's just like, if you haven't seen all the other Spider-Man movies that don't exist in this continuity, then you don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> right. You know what I, I mean? think it's Spider-Man 5, isn't it? This was 5, yes. Okay. Just wondering if I'd missed one somewhere. But it just the whole fact that there was a Harry Osborn and then he went away. Where was that in the first movie? Why not we, just mention yeah. that? Why, why? We saw him in the first movie, didn't we? No, he's never been in. He wasn't yeah. in there at all? I swear no. I'd seen that weird kid. He's like super... I'm not sure how to describe him. Okay, no, no. Here, here if we're talking about weird... Let's go back to, what was the deal with the scientist guy? Oh, my Lord. That guy belonged in a Joel Schumacher Batman movie. Yeah. with Every the, line of dialogue that moron had. The makeup had. and the lipstick. And the like, yeah, and uh, Electro Viva making the way to go with Osborne Corp. Or what, and I'd be just like, and even that is like a more normal. This felt like a Mel Blanc character in a <laughs> Looney Tune circa 1946. Yeah, and yeah, they had him like totally made up with like white makeup on his face, pink lipstick on, and like an eyeliner and, and mascara and crap all around his eyes, and you could totally see it. It wasn't like this is just stage makeup or, you know, just, you know, that kind of thing. Like, oh, he's on film, so you got to put makeup on him. It was thick and crusty and you could see it in all the close-up shots. And there was a lot of weird close-up shots and stuff of that guy. It was weird. He was, it didn't fit. He didn't belong in this movie. No, it, it was another one of those things where it's just like, wait, where did that guy come from? It's like the one... Dick Tracy villain in uh, <laughs> The Rocketeer. Do you remember that? Where you're just like, wait, wait, wait. Why, who's that guy with the giant rubber face? Why is he in this movie? I don't know. That felt like somebody putting in his own two cents. And he, and this was his contribution. Is We want to make it campier? What other <laughs> excuse was there for that kind of thing? There were a bunch of like little throwaway characters or whatever that were in there because they're characters in the comics. And I think that's part of what Movie Bob was talking about. But like there was Alistair Smythe who worked at Oscorp and they mentioned his name once. And I was just like, why? Why is that guy even in here? It's so that they can bring him back in Amazing Spider-Man 4 if they want to. And Felicia Hardy, who is Harry's secretary, I guess she was supposed to be in this movie for a reason. But the real reason was that's the black cat and she's going to show up later. But the movie would have been better without things like that, I'm, I'm sad to say. And then that moron from the end of Amazing Spider-Man 1 with the hat shows up again to walk through and to like do the exact same thing that he did in the first movie, which was to say, you think you're the only superhero in this world? Well, you got another thing coming because the path of a righteous man is beset on all sides, Mr. Stark, by the inequities of... <laughs> by, I, I, it's been a long time. I don't remember... The, 
that guy was there. That was Doctor Sequel Setup, I think, is what they called him in the credits. <laughs> Oh, uh, but anyways, going back. Yes, go ahead. Harry Osborne was kind of a, just a weird kind of creepy emo looking guy the whole time that seems, he seemed really out of place the whole time too, just not quite right. James Franco was, I think, a much better Harry. Is Harry supposed to be creepy and emo? Yeah, I mean, Harry is a weakling and... Uh, he can never do anything right. Uh, this is, of course, the actual Harry Osborn from the comics, not whatever the Ultimate Universe Harry is. <laughs> uh, who knows? That Goblin Curse stuff might be right out of the Ultimate Comics. You know, in a way, it was kind of okay that Norman became a lizard, although I was waiting for Norman to sh- pop up again, because he's the Green Goblin, not Harry. I just assumed he faked his death. <laughs> but... uh yeah, that whole goblin curse and like your hands are going to start to shake and he's already growing this thing on his neck and and all that stuff and he's degenerating into something. Is that honestly better than I put on a fright mask and nobody knows who I am and so I can go kill and steal and destroy my enemies' laboratories and all that stuff? Is it? Is it? Is it better? That's just... I mean, I guess that's open to interpretation but when I found out... That ultimate Green Goblin is a Hulk-like character that becomes a goblin. I was just like, oh, well, but we have a lot of guys like that. Why do that to the Green Goblin? I don't know. It, it, I don't think they've done the Green Goblin right yet. And he's the best Spider-Man villain. And so, well, I... Well, when they, uh, <laughs> when they reboot it to the spectacular Spider-Man after the next movie, maybe they'll try it that way. Oh, the, just the, the, every time you reboot, too, it feels like when, like, you drain a camcorder battery and then you recharge it and it has a little bit less juice than it had the first time and it has a little bit less juice than it had the second time. Do you know what I mean? Maybe there's a more 21st century uh, equivalent to that. But, but you know what I mean? The, the yeah. law of diminishing the, returns. The battery never fills up quite as much the next time. And after you've used the same battery for like a year, all of a sudden what used to be a three-hour battery is now a 15-minute battery somehow. Um, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it does seem that way with reboots. That uh, it's a little bit lesser than it used to be. Although eh, not necessarily. I mean, I guess the Batman franchise came out pretty well when they rebooted it. Sometimes it seems like you got to give it a little bit of time, but um, can they? Will Sony, how long, do you know, have any idea how many years they are allowed to wait before exercising the option and they'll lose it? I believe it's five years is what the lawyer's sign wrote up in 97 or whenever, whenever that deal got made. And five years, I guess, is a forever amount of time in filmmaking. I don't know, but next year when the Fantastic Four reboot comes out, don't be surprised if a bunch of people go, huh, well, you know, we have seen that. Plus, Disney is making it an Incredibles 2, finally. I'll wait for that. If 90% of people over 15 don't say that, then I'm wrong, and I can eat my shoe and my words. But I think that's what's going to happen. I think people will say... You know, we saw those movies and they they weren't all that magical. Do we need another one? Do we need to start over on this? But I could be wrong. Maybe it will look really, really exciting to people and they'll be like, oh, cool. My thought, though, is from now on, anything that doesn't say Marvel Studios at the beginning, people are going to be like, oh, well, I don't know if we need... Do Marvel Studios do that one? No. no? It's, okay. It's, uh, yeah, I was always kind of flabbergasted by the whole Incredibles versus the Fantastic Four thing and how much better the Incredibles were at being the Fantastic Four than the Fantastic Four were. How much cooler they were with the Fantastic Four's powers than the Fantastic Four was. It kind of blew me away a little bit. Well, there are things that they do on that movie I don't know. That probably took 25 years of Fantastic Four comics before somebody thought of doing that with those powers. And yet it was all there in a 90-minute movie of just like every inventive way Dash could run. 
You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you could run fast, what would be cool that he could do with it? Everybody give me seven things by this time tomorrow. And they ended up using like 22 of those on the list. That's how I felt about The Incredibles. It was so chock full of inventiveness and creativity and magic. And uh, I don't Fantastic know. People Four. don't work that hard on movies anymore. Mr. Fantastic danced with his stretched out arms. Oh, did he? Oh, okay. Well, then I take it back. Let's uh, <laughs> announcer man. Can you wait? Who edits this show? <laughs> Marshall Latham. Oh, thanks, Marshall. Because <laughs> I'm getting real tired of doing it. Okay. okay one, uh, one more thing. Oh, I was going to say. Let's oh. name one more good thing about this thing. Well, how about the score? To... Huh? Do you remember uh... that part where Electro gets his powers and you start hearing this voice <laughs> and the voice is rapping? <laughs> Did anybody hear that? Did I lose my mind? Did I have like a little mini aneurysm? And it wasn't enough to kill me or knock me out, but it was enough for me to hear killing hey, yo, yo to you, monkey, and the Sony image would buy the soundtrack. <laughs> I I heard this chanting voice and I was like, what is that? Where is somebody's cell phone going off behind me? And I looked and because it's the second week in release, there was nobody behind me. <laughs> It was actually part of the movie, and I was like, oh, man, did this really happen? Did somebody say this was a good idea, and then and they didn't take it out the very first time they saw it? Yeah, and the soundtrack on time, the soundtrack was by Hans Zimmer and The Magnificent Six, but not The Magnificent Seven, it turns out. They were separate. I, but I yeah. believe the lawyers have said that they must now legally call themselves The Six. <laughs> It was like they took a Hans Zimmer score and then did a dubstep remix of it. And that's what they used was the dub. You know, somebody on YouTube called the Magnificent Six, like took the Hans Zimmer score and did their dubstep remix of it. And then somehow that's what ended up on the actual movie by accident. And they're like, oh, crap, we use that. That stupid YouTube video. You guys can't take it off. Oh, it's already shoot. on the soundtrack. Oh, shoot. Okay, well, we'll just say that Hans Zimmer and Magnificent Six did it. It was pretty awful. Like, I kept hearing it, and it was like, in the background, along with the, the, the score. And the score was really bad just to begin with. It was like, thinking, I don't know, like Rocky or something like that. This, this weird really triumphant -y kind of sounding things at the wrong times and st I don't it was very strange well see I thought that we were going to see the end credits and it's going to be one of those names that's going to say music composed by where I go what else has that guy done and you're like ooh I, I don't know this must be this guy's first gig you know what I mean uh -huh. it's like somebody cut their teeth on this score uh, and and maybe we'll never hear from him again but it was Hans Zimmer. That guy didn't just start doing this job. I, what a weird contribution. During the end credits, they play like this fanfare. And suddenly I was like, oh, okay, well, that's what Hans Zimmer sounds like. And then boom, it turned into the dubstep remix again. It wasn't good. But the thing that I wanted to point out. Okay. Which I thought, I mean, we mentioned this as we were walking out of the theater saying, what in the hell? There was a commercial for the X, the Fox X-Men film in the middle of the credits. Uh... Oh, well, this is like when the Penguin oh, and the right. Riddler team up to kill Batman. Except for that they were teaming up to kill you and I. I've never seen that before. That was crazy. It, because it interrupts the credits. You know what I mean? It's not like the music fades out and then we get our great post-credit sequence, which you've come to demand because of Marvel Studios. It just stopped and it started to show this clip from X-Men Days of Future Past and then it showed the logo and then the credits continued. Yeah, it was super weird. Didn't make a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, and, and it was a Fox movie and Spider-Man is a Sony movie. Maybe there will come a day that, you know, these studios that own Marvel properties but aren't with Marvel Studios may find some, find it within their hearts to do some kind of a Marvel team up where now, okay, Fantastic Four are going to join in with the Avengers and this will be backed by both studios. And maybe that's what's happened, except for that it's the X Men are going to team up with Spider Man 
down the line or something weird like that. Although that's like a, a not a very obvious team up. Do the X Men and Spider Man do a lot together in the comics? No, not a lot, but everybody crossed over with Spider Man. Right. Spider Man's uh, the town bicycle. <laughs> yes, that's right. Everyone Everybody gets, a, gets ride. a ride. And then it just ended and credits resumed. And it didn't even necessarily, I mean, it, it's like they wanted you to think this was some kind of, you know, like a Marvel Studios thing where it kind of leads, oh, this is the next movie in the other series. And oh, that's cool. They wanted you to kind of believe that it was that same kind of a thing, except that it isn't. They didn't even say, like, Days of Future Past, May 24th, be there or be square, or anything like that. It was just thrown in. Okay, so I just want to say two other things. I loved the way that the Spider-Man costume looked. But I've been saying that for months. Since they first revealed what the costume was going to look like in this, I was just like, wow! How can they get Electro that wrong and Spider-Man that right? What did you think of the costume and the way it moved and the way... He... I liked that it did move. It didn't look. It wasn't. Didn't look like it was made out of rubber or whatever it is that they've made superhero costumes out of ever since Batman in the nineties. It wasn't made of like it was his skin. It was actually some kind of a material. At the very start of the movie, the Spider-Man symbol comes up, and then it starts to like shake around. <laughs> And you're like, wow, what the crap? And then you see that then it pulls out and it's like on his back. Uh-huh. And it is the suit and the suit actually moves. And you can see that there's like some creases and folds in it and stuff as he flies and then shoots his web out. And I thought, oh, that's cool. It's like it's actually spandex or whatever the heck a real superhero costume would probably be made out of. I thought that was cool. It looked good. Uh, yeah, and yeah, like I was saying, it's not that weird, like, rubbery stuff that every costume seems to be made of. I, I, I think that that's a vote, or a, a, a notch, at least, in the favor of the movie. The, the, they got the main character's costume the best it's ever looked. I don't know, the, the, you know, for the most part, the movie looked good. His eyes weren't yellowish like they, they were weren't. in the last one. That was good. The they're all more silvery this time around. Are they supposed to be silvery or is it just supposed to be white? It's just supposed to be white. Then the other thing I wanted to just briefly mention is they do the thing with Gwen Stacy that you do with Gwen Stacy. And I mean at least we'd had a whole movie and a half to get to like her and you know, what I mean her whole purpose wasn't just to die. But I was waiting for it to happen. I just said there, there was a moment early, early on with like the specter of her father. It was actually that scene where she breaks up with him outside of the Chinese restaurant. Or... Dim sum. What's that? That's what they were there for was dim sum. What's that? It's a Chinese kind of buffet stuff. Okay. So it was a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. Uh, I, I liked that scene where, you know, he's all stammering. And he's like, I can't be with you. And I see your father all over. And then they break up, and then they get it together, and they break up, and they get back together. Uh, but uh, from, from like that si sentence, I was just like, "Oh, okay, she's she's gone, isn't she?" In this one, this is going to be the last Gwen Stacy movie. And I, I see, I don't know what I, I I adore that character, but it's also because of what she represented to me as a comic book reader, and how I first reacted as a little boy f reading that issue. Where she's killed, and then as a, a grown man, thinking about it, and then there's the moment where she's falling, and yeah, just here's your brief comic book 101. The Green Goblin throws Gwen Stacy off of the George Washington Bridge, or the Brooklyn Bridge, depending on how it is told, and Peter shoots a web to catch her, and it breaks her neck and kills her, and that's the shock of. The death of Gwen Stacy. Not that they killed the love interest of the hero, although that's a big deal. But how they did it. That somebody was just like, no, no, Peter's going to be the one that does it. Inadvertently. And so when she was falling, I leaned over and I said, "Will it? Do you, would they dare? But they threw so much shit on the screen. 
to make it so there's no possible other way that he could have saved her. That it was like, okay, they, they did do it and they did kill her the same way and all that stuff, but it, it didn't work as well as the comics. And once again, you know, the way that the comics did it worked well or we wouldn't, I wouldn't still be talking about it 40 years later. <laughs> I, I, it's still brave that they killed her and that they did have the snap and the sound effect and him thinking that she's all right for a minute and then realizing that she's not. I, I thought that that worked well, but... I don't know. It, it 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 didn't work as well as it should have for me. Right. I should have been just like, oh my gosh, no, they did. Please don't do it, guys. Don't do it. I take it back. Don't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Wasn't <laughs> what was your thought? What was your feeling? Did you know she was done for in this movie? I didn't know. I thought that it was possible that they might just let her go to England, and he has to. And maybe you get Mary Jane at the end saying, face it, Tiger, you just hit the jackpot or uh -huh. something like that. And so he's like, oh, maybe I got something else to look forward to because <laughs> Gwen's gone to England to hook up with Harry Potter. And they did shoot that scene, but they decided to cut it out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, all the Mary Jane Watson stuff is gone from this movie. Huh. But, but yeah, I, I thought... That that was a possibility. Why were they inside a clock tower? That's another one of those stupid con contrived things. Like the plane. It's like, I know. The big final fight will happen. They'll go inside of a clock tower. And then they'll have to like run around on the gears inside of a clock tower. And avoid the crushers. Wait, crushers? Yeah, this clock has just giant crushers. They did at least cut the crushers out in the final edit, but the the gears on the clock and like the Gwen was having to like jump from one gear to the other, and then when she falls, all the gears fall down with her, and he shoots his web down, and it goes through all in the slow mo shot through all the gears that are flying everywhere and catches her, but just too late. And the other thing was weird that I thought about that scene, if. Somebody, especially somebody that you love a lot, they're injured. Something's happened to them. They're not breathing. Their heart's not beating. What are you going to do? Are you going to hold them and say, yeah, you're okay. Come on. You're okay. What is the most likely thing that someone is going to do when you find that this person is not breathing and their heart's not beating? Try to resuscitate them. Right. Why do they not do that? Well, in the comics, there were no cell phones, and the goblin was still alive to laugh and point out that Peter had just done this. Okay. So which is why Peter goes crazy and tears the goblin's head off in the next issue. And, and again, things work for all these years for reason. They didn't kill the goblin. Did they kill Electro? I don't really know for sure. I guess, but he if he, they showed he could discorporate. Yeah, and then come back together. When I saw that the first time, I thought, oh, there's no way they can beat this guy. <laughs> He's immortal. Yeah, that's a good what point. is Spider-Man going to do to a guy that can just turn into a ghost and come back? It's kind of like Sandman when they showed that, yeah, this guy could become molecules and then reform. It's like, wow, the, you, uh, there's nothing that you can do against this guy. Yeah, it was, but yeah, they, they still come up with, yeah, he's a battery and we'll just give him lots of power and he'll blow up. And that means he'll never come back together. Yeah, I don't know. I, I wish they would perform CPR, try. I mean, this is the love of his life or whatever, and she's not breathing and her heart's not, you know, you need to do what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's what you would do, right? If you're like, oh my gosh, she's she's dying. Oh my, and she, you would start doing the stuff to try and save her. You wouldn't just go, oh no, and cry. The end. It just, I don't know, it kind of bugs me. And it would have, I think, been a little bit more powerful if he was doing something as he was freaking out and saying, no, you're okay, come on. You know, instead of just sitting there and saying, oh look, she's got a little bit of blood coming out of her nose. She got a bloody nose. That's what she died of. But that wasn't that important of a thing, I suppose. The end. Yeah. I, I, Is there more? <laughs> not really. I I mean, we could talk about Peter's dad and the whole mystery of his birth and all that stuff. But I just, I don't care. I don't, it, it, it just, it feels like another thing that somebody 
that they had a bee in their bonnet about that and they added it into the screenplay and they shot it but the movie was not originally about that yeah they're just like oh wait we talked about that whole his parents thing at the end of the last one so we totally got to pay it off or else people will be mad and i was mad in the first one because they they made it like that's what the movie was about and then they didn't answer that question but i I don't know. I think it probably would have been a stronger movie without any of that stuff. The plane crash at the beginning or the secret subway car that came up out of the ground. <laughs> because, I mean, help me out. I, I Maybe I blacked out. That all built toward what? Was he able to heal Harry using his father's formula? Was he able to solve the electro problem using that? Was he able to bring Gwen back to life doing that? Was he able to make other Spider-Men using his father's research, I don't think there was any result to it except for an explanation of the spider serum is not going to help somebody unless they are part of the bloodline because I used <laughs> my own DNA, I used my own DNA in it or whatever, but no one can be Spider-Man but you so don't try it at home. So the funny thing was and we'll, we'll wrap it up with this Sure the movie finished oh. <laughs> and the credits came up and you leaned over to me uh -oh. and you said, you know what? Still not as bad as Man of Steel. Yeah. Well, it was competently <laughs> shot. The fight scenes were entertaining and they didn't go on too long. There was shaky cam in the plane fight scene, though. I don't know if you noticed that. Oh, I did notice it, it but, me. but it it didn't show its ugly head for the rest of the movie. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. I mean, it didn't spit in the face of everything that Spider-Man has ever represented. I mean, there were big stretches of illogic as there were in Man of Steel, but every single time... Peter went out of his way to help a person or to save a person. I mean, how many people did he save from Electro or from a car accident or from a fire or from, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Every time they did that, it's just, you know, holding up a mirror to Man of Steel and this is what a hero does. Anyway, I just, and I'm Superman sorry. Superman didn't even do, do nothing. nothing. No, he didn't. <laughs> I Yeah, I, I didn't think that it was a very good movie. I thought it was the weakest Spider-Man movie that has been made, but it could actually have been worse. I mean, I don't know that they were intentionally trying to derail it like appears to be the case of the Joel Schumacher 1997 Batman movie where you see that and you go, they had to have known you guys. This is the 15th ice pun in two minutes. You know what I mean? It's like somebody somewhere had a hundred million dollars of Warner Brothers stock shorted. <laughs> I, I wasn't completely soured on life the way that I was by Man of Steel, and especially the people that like Man of Steel. So if they make an, another Spider-Man movie and I can see it for free like I saw this one, <laughs> I probably will do it. I didn't think Andrew Garfield was bad. I didn't think any of the performances were particularly bad. The script was bad. and Yeah, the, the score was bad. <laughs> it was a misfire, but it wasn't one of those things where it took out a whole city block and took out, you know, all these people because it, it it shot so badly. It was a rocket test in the middle of Times Square, and which is what I felt like Man of Steel was. I, I'm sorry I keep bringing up Man of Steel, but that was why I leaned over. You disagree or agree, if you wouldn't mind? Um, I probably agree. I don't think it was as bad as Man of Steel. I didn't find a lot to recommend in Man of Steel. Um, there was very little of anything to like about Man of Steel. This at least had some things to like. There were some good scenes. There was some stuff that made sense. There was some stuff that was fun. There was a lot of problems with it. It's funny because the poster had three villains on it. And I expected there to be... I was waiting for the time when all three of them showed up at once somehow for him to have to fight all of them at the same time. Because that's what the poster showed. Yeah, because that's what the poster led me to believe was going to happen. I'm glad that they didn't go that route. To tell you the truth, it worked out better the way they did it. I like that Rhino was just the afterthought guy because he was not needed and they probably didn't even need to go that i mean they could have just let harry be the afterthought guy at the very end like they did in the end of spider-man 2 where harry is 
he's found the stuff and then he's got his green tie on or whatever. And you're like, oh, something's coming next time. <laughs> kind of a thing would have been fine because there was already a big finale and it felt like it dragged on a little bit when we had to have a second big finale with the other villain that showed up at the very second that the first villain was killed. But yeah, it was it was better. It had soul in it, which Man of Steel did not. It had heart to it. Um, do you remember that scene in Amazing Spider-Man where Peter is hurt and so all the construction workers line up their uh, cranes so that he can get to the Oscorp building <laughs> and save his girlfriend? I really, really liked that scene. And I didn't think, think that there was anything as emotionally satisfying as that scene in this movie. And I don't know why that is. But there was a, a, a moment where Spider-Man flew over a cop in slow motion. Because everything would go normal speed and then slow motion and then normal speed and then slow motion. And I'm not really complaining about that. It's just the choice they made. But the cop smiles when he sees Spider-Man. And I was like, oh, that's nice. Yeah. That was a, an odd thing that happened a lot in this film was every time Spider-Man would fight a villain, and it was really obvious in the end when he's fighting the rhino, because the rhino's busting out, like, submachine guns out of the arms of his suit and just shooting these things like crazy, and yet there's a freaking crowd of people standing behind this little barricade watching like this is a show that's being put on for them. This guy's shooting automatic weapons... Right over there on the other side of the street. And none of these people seem to fear for their lives. It's like, oh, no, he would only shoot at cops. He wouldn't <laughs> shoot at us. We're bystanders. And there was a huge crowd watching Electro do his thing, too. None of them were like, this guy's blowing things up. Maybe I should leave. They all watched and cheered Spider-Man on. It's kind of the same little thing where, you know, the, the people are glad to see him, which was cool. This Spider-Man doesn't have to deal with as much of... And they started off with, like, this montage of people saying, Oh, Spider-Man should stop being a vigilante and let the cops do their work. But they never went with that beyond that. It was just like this opening scene, like, Hey, a Spider-Man movie has to be about this, so let's put this in. But then they never went any further with it. And but if you saw the, the way Spider-Man works, even once, and how he puts himself out there for every single person that might get hurt, I think it would win you over. You'd just be like, holy cow. Yeah. And, and and I liked that about Max Dillon there, where he's like, Spider-Man saved me one time. He said he needed me. For, there were times when he seemed like a Forrest Gump kind of character, like he was the janitor at Oscorp. <laughs> right. And then there were other times where he's like, I designed this power grid. And I was like, no, you didn't. You're the guy that cleans up the spilled coffee after the meeting where they designed the power grid, right? I don't know if that was, again, two screenwriters with two different ideas <laughs> of who Max Dillon is, but he was a moron. And then he was, oh, no, this is actually a competent th fellow. Yeah, he, he didn't work out very well for sure. But, uh, yeah, Spider-Man never did have to deal much with the is he a menace or is he a threat <laughs> kind of a thing where you know, there's no not an option of a good option. He's either a menace or a threat, not a hero. You know, he never had to deal with the, the everybody trying to turn the tide against him. And he can only do what's right and show people, the few people that actually see him, the truth kind of a thing. But that's all good. Sorry, we were supposed to be ending and I just came up with another thing. Instead, we're going to end... <laughs> It well, was better shows, than Man of Steel. These shows go the as long as that they need to go. <laughs> and as soon as we hit stop, we'll come up with three or four other things that we didn't talk about. And that's fine. It's just there are a bunch of things. And, you know, it's probably good that we didn't get the Jameson scene and the debates of whether he's a menace or a threat and all that stuff. Because it would have been yet another thing filling this movie. Another plot point that wasn't satisfactorily covered. But somebody somewhere needs to make a decision that... We just need to simplify the next one. I know that you, every movie has to be bigger and the stakes have to be greater, but what if they weren't? Yeah. And so uh, I don't think it's until that happen. day happens when Great Britain makes a Spider-Man movie. And it was like, wow, they spent what on this? $42 million. 
and it's still more than they usually spend on a movie. <laughs> it was like, wow, you could really feel the economy going on in this movie. Anyhow, I, I don't know why I'm talking about that. It just uh, less is more sometimes, guys. More is very rarely more. Characters count for something. More character, and then the action means more. You're damn right. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. I have been Big Anklevich. And I have been Rich Outfield. And do whatever a spider can. That's right. It's been a web, any size. That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons okay. 3.0 license. One of my favorite comics was uh, Spider-Man Wolverine. Uh, there was a, 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 a double-sized issue in about 87 that was uh, really, really cool. And it was kind of my first exposure to Wolverine. But, but again, it was just it was a one-shot. Where it's like these two cross paths and, of course, they have to fight and then they end up working together. But what was unique about this was they, they work together at first and then they fight because these guys are not friendly. These guys cannot coexist in the same universe. Do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Wolverine is, comes from a world that's so corrupt that ultimately Spider-Man is like, you're a bad guy. I don't know if you know that, but you're a bad guy. And Wolverine's like, nobody calls me bad. And they fight. And it ends with, you know, just this big, huge throwdown between these two characters because Spider-Man is just sick of all the crap of Wolverine's world. And and I was just like, wow, this is grown up. This is one of the first grown up books that I had read as a little boy. And uh, I, I think that that would work as a movie, but I don't know why we're talking about it. I'm sorry. Because uh, of the weird post credit oh, scene. Yeah. I, see, if they had shot something Spider-Man related or whatever to hint that there might be some potential crossover or whatever, I think a lot of people would have been excited about that. But this was confusing more than anything else because it's not like they say, now a sneak preview of X-Men Days of Future Past. It just started showing a scene like this is your post credit sequence and it turned out to be a clip from X-Men Days of Future Past. Very strange. Oh, shoot, it wasn't recording. <laughs>